It can be bluesy. It can be funky. It can be romantic. It can be edgy. It can be mysterious. And it can be very pretty. It creates movement, allows for seamless key changes, and sounds amazing virtually anywhere in your chord progression. So I'm going out on a limb here to say that this is the most important and versatile chord of them all. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how this chord is constructed, different voicings and inversions that you can experiment with, and most importantly, I'm gonna show you a number of ways you can immediately start using this chord in your songwriting. And so without delaying the reveal any longer, we are of course talking about the dominant seven chord. And let's begin by looking at how this chord is constructed. If we look at the diatonic chords in the key of C and lay them out, we see that we have the C major, the D minor, the E minor, the F major, the G major, the A minor, and the B diminished. Now chords are constructed in a particular way by taking the scale and leapfrogging over every second note. So in the key of C, to create the C major triad, we jump from C to E and then E to G, the one, the three, and the five. To make the D minor, we go from D to F and then F to A. To make the E minor, we do the same thing, leapfrogging over every second note. And this is how triads are constructed. And if we follow this approach and map them all out, we get major, minor, and diminished triads in each position. If we now add a fourth note to these chords, something changes about the quality of the chords. So to continue the process of leapfrogging, we add a B note or a seventh to the C major, and that creates a C major seven. With the D minor, we add a C note, which is a flat seven relative to the D, and that creates a D minor seven. E minor also becomes an E minor seven. F becomes an F major seven in fourth position, but the five chord, the G chord, when we leapfrog and add a fourth note to it, we get an F note appearing. Now the F note in relation to the G chord is a flat seven. So now we have a major triad with a flat seven added, and this makes it different to a major seven. A major seven is a major triad, a one, three, five, with a seventh note added. That seventh note needs to be a semitone away from the root or the octave. The dominant chord is exactly the same in terms of the first three notes, but it is that fourth note that differs. That flat seven note on top of the major triad gives us a dominant seven chord. And the fact that it naturally occurs in the fifth position of a diatonic sequence is relevant and often determines how we use the dominant chord. But as you'll see, when we think about the dominant chord as being something that we can move around in different positions, it becomes incredibly powerful and very versatile. So at this point, it's worth just having a quick listen to the difference between these chords. How much difference does that flat seven make compared to the natural seven? So if we take a C major triad, add a B note to it, we have a C major seven. We can do it down here as well. And it's quite a sweet sounding chord. If we, however, take that major seven down another semitone to make it a flat seven, we get a C dominant seven. And that has a different mood and a different flavor to it. So one way of thinking about the dominant chord is sitting between the major and the minor in terms of mood. So the major chord is generally thought of as fairly bright, happy, stable. The minor chord or the minor seven chord is darker with more melancholy. But the dominant chord kind of sits in between them. And this is what makes it so interesting. It's not really happy or sad. It's not really major or minor, even though it has a major three and certainly leans more to being identified as a major type of chord, that flat seven really gives it this dark and unsettling sound. And this again allows us to use it in lots of interesting ways. So one of the reasons it's got a slightly unsettling sound is because of the intervals that are arranged inside 
the dominant seven chord. And if you look at the arrangement of these intervals for a second, you'll see something interesting going on between the three and the flat seven. The distance between the three and the flat seven is a distance of three tones, otherwise known as tritone. And if we look at a C dominant chord, for example, and just isolate the three and the flat seven, those two notes together, that's the sound of the tritone. And it's quite unsettling and quite dark and has an interesting history as well. At one point in time, it was referred to as the devil's interval and was very unpopular with certain composers throughout history, often being described as restless dissonance. But for some composers like Leonard Bernstein, it allowed him to create some truly iconic melodies, such as that of West Side Story's Maria. You also have the Simpsons theme incorporating this interval. And the tritone really is very compelling because of this restless dissonance. That restless dissonance is unstable. And when we have an unstable element, it wants to resolve. And that need to resolve creates a lot of movement. That chord, that dominant chord, generally wants to take us somewhere else. And so it has a tremendous amount of propulsion packed within it. The question is, where does it resolve to? And if we're going back to a diatonic sequence, the five chord generally wants to resolve back to the one. So in the key of C, that G7 chord really wants to pull us back home. But that really is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to possible functions and uses of the dominant seven chord. Let's look at the song Isn't She Lovely by Stevie Wonder because this song has in it three dominant chords that are all being used in different ways. One, two, three, four. Now in the key of E, the chords that naturally occur would be E major, F sharp minor, G sharp minor, a major, B7, C sharp minor, D sharp diminished, back to E. In the case of Isn't She Lovely, we have several dominant chords being used to replace these naturally occurring diatonic chords. And the first one is that F sharp dominant nine. Now, all dominant chords can have extensions added to them, like major and minor chords. The 9, the 11, and the 13 can be added to each of those three chord types. And the function of that F-sharp dominant 9 is to create a slightly lighter, jazzier sounding chord progression. Because if we play it as it would naturally occur as an F-sharp minor, you would get this. Which is a totally different feel. So instead, Stevie Wonder opted for a borrowed chord, an outside chord off the same root note, but changing the quality of the chord from the minor to the dominant. And in this case, he's really making that substitution because he wants the mood and the sound and the feeling that the dominant chord brings as opposed to the minor. The next dominant chord we hear is the B11. And it's in the five chord position, so we expect it to be dominant. But instead of getting the dominant seven, we again get an extension. The 11 this time gives us a lovely floaty kind of quality. And that pulls us back to the E chord, the home chord, before quickly jumping up to this, the third dominant chord, the G sharp seven. Now that chord has been placed there very deliberately for a specific function. Naturally, that would be a G sharp minor in the key of E. But the G sharp seven pulls us towards a very particular chord. And that chord is this chord, the C sharp minor. Now we talked before about this idea that the tritone is really unstable and the tritone is only found in the dominant chord. That's what makes it unique. The fact that it's unstable and wants to resolve gives it a tremendous pulling power to a new chord. And what we see here is a G sharp seven with a five one relationship to the chord we're heading for. So this is one of the ways that a lot of composers and songwriters use the dominant chord. They use it by setting up a five one relationship 
with a chord they really want to draw our ear to or draw our attention to. In this case, we're getting to the end of the chord cycle and we're coming back to start again at that C sharp minor. That G sharp dominant seven pulls us back to that C sharp minor. It creates the tension that is then released by the C sharp minor in a way that's far more satisfying than if we went from the G sharp minor. So let's just hear those chords in sequence again. We start at the C sharp minor, we move to the F sharp dominant, the dominant nine chord in the second position, used for its textures and its colors. We then move to the B11, a floatier option for the five chord, which pulls us back to the one, before going to the G sharp dominant seven, which deliberately then pulls us to the C sharp minor to start the cycle again. Now, there are lots of different arrangements of this song, and as you listen to different versions, you pick up on some interesting choices being made, especially when it comes to the dominant seven chords. So one of the things you sometimes hear is that F sharp dominant nine having another extension added to it, and that's the 13. Again, another color. Another variation you hear is when we go to the B11. You often hear the B11 played first before moving to this chord, which is a B7 flat nine. And this particular move gives us an insight into one of the beautiful things about dominant chords, which is that they can take not only extensions, but things called alterations. So we can add nines, elevens, and thirteens to major, minor, and dominant chords. But only dominant chords really handle the alterations. And the alterations are flat nine, sharp nine, flat five, and sharp five. Dominant chords handle these beautifully because those notes, those alterations, ramp up the tension. And the structure of the dominant chord is already unstable because of the tritone. So while the extensions are there to add color to those chords, the alterations are really there to ramp up the tension. And sometimes we want to ramp up that tension so that the resolution feels more satisfying. In this case, the B11 going to the E chord sounds lovely, but the B11 going to the B7 flat nine and then resolving to the E chord just creates that little bit extra tension. It's the same thing with the G sharp dominant seven. One of the common substitutions for that chord is a G sharp seven sharp five. Now we're using one of the other alterations, the sharp five, and that chord sounds like this. And that's quite tense, but it resolves beautifully. So with those alterations in place, we get this. created a free PDF outlining the different functions of the dominant chord and showing all the different inversions that I'm using throughout this video. So if you're interested in that, check out the link below. Dominant chords are unique in their ability to handle all the different alterations that we can stack on top of them. So much so that if you ever look at jazz charts, you'll often see that a dominant chord is written with a little alt in brackets next to the chord. And what this is doing is saying to the performer, Choose which alterations you want to put on top of that chord. Make those choices as you're going around the chord sequences. So if we were in the key of A minor, and that was our home chord, the E7 is the five chord that wants to pull us back to that A minor. So in terms of alterations, we have a sharp nine available, we have a flat nine available, which sounds lovely as a sequence. But we can also have more than one alteration on a dominant chord at the same time. So we could have, for example, an E7 flat nine flat five, which is really, really tense. And the longer you hold it, the more uncomfortable it gets. but the resolution sounds so satisfying. We could also do a sharp nine flat five.
And that amount of tension isn't going to work for every kind of song, but it's amazing to see how many popular contemporary songs do contain little moments of altered dominant chords that are just there to really create this tension and then have it resolved by the next chord in the sequence. So let's look at a concept called secondary dominance, which is using a dominant chord in a position that's not the fifth position in order to pull our ear to the next chord in the sequence. And the easiest way to do this is to go back to the key of C. And again, just to familiarize ourselves with the natural chords, we get a D minor, an E minor, an F major, a G major or a G dominant, A minor, B diminished, back to C. If we go to the two chord and make it A dominant, This pulls us to the G chord because the relationship between D and G is 5-1. So a move that you'll hear a lot is to go one chord to a dominant two, dominant five, back to the one. What if we take the three chord and make it dominant? That's got some real pulling power to not only the F chord that comes next, but also to the A minor. The 5-1 relationship exists now between the E7 and the A minor. And you can hear that the A minor now feels like the new tonal center. This is what a secondary dominant does. It shifts our attention away from the original home base. And really draws our attention to a new tonal center, in this case, A minor. Let's make the fourth chord dominant. Now the fourth chord being dominant is actually a really common move in a lot of genres. So going from a four dominant back to a one chord, is not a problem. Sounds really good. But if we also look at the 5-1 relationship that gets created between the F chord and this chord here, the B flat, the B flat is a new chord. It's not actually in the key. So turning the four chord into a dominant chord introduces an opportunity to bring into play a new chord from outside the key and potentially modulate to a new key. So that's a really lovely little set of chords that is starting to sound like it wants to go to a new key because we've brought into play that that B flat. The five chord is of course naturally occurring as a dominant chord. If we move to the six chord and make it dominant, the five one relationship that's now being set up is to this chord, the D, the two chord in the key of C. So this is a chance to either draw our attention to the D minor, which naturally occurs, or we can turn that into a D major, which sounds great. Now that's a move you hear a lot in jazz. That's the one, dominant six, minor two, dominant five, a one, six, two, five. But you can see that there's a little bit of versatility there where we could actually play three of those four chords as dominant. We can play the six chord as a dominant, which pulls us to the two chord as a dominant, which pulls us to the five chord as a dominant, which brings us home to the one. So the dominant chord has within it, again, because of that tritone, that unstable structure, it has this pulling power and that pulling power is something that we as songwriters and composers can really leverage to create motion and momentum with our song. If we go back and look at Isn't She Lovely through the lens of this pulling power, 
that dominant chords have, you'll see a pattern emerging. So we start with the C sharp minor, go to the dominant two chord, and that dominant two chord is pulling us to that five chord, creating a five one relationship between F sharp and B. The B11 is now pulling us to the one chord, the home chord. That dominant three, G sharp seven, is now pulling us back to the C sharp minor where we begin the cycle again. Each of those three dominant chords has a pulling power that keeps the whole cycle going round. But the fun doesn't stop there because of course we have a whole genre of music called the blues that is constructed entirely from these dominant seven chords. And this is a fact that makes the blues very different from other genres of music using the one, four, five chord sequence. So if we go one, four, five in the key of C and play them all as triads, you will hear that in a lot of country, a lot of folk. That's a really classic sound. A lot of rock uses the one, four, five as well. The difference with the blues is that in a blues that one, four, and five are all played as dominant chords. So we get this. And this is one of the reasons why blues continues to be timeless and fascinating for musicians and songwriters, because each time we go to a new dominant chord, we're essentially kind of changing key. We're not staying within the one key. Anyone who's tried to solo effectively around a blues knows that they can use a pentatonic scale to really get across all three chords, but to really get inside great blues improvisation and consider great blues melody writing, we need to consider the fact that each time we move to a new chord, we're essentially shifting the tonal center. But there are other genres where dominant chords really form the backbone. Listen to any James Brown record and you're sure to hear the dominant nine chord appearing like this. Such a great sound. And there, the dominant chord is the one chord. It's creating the tonal center. It's not being used as a color or a substitute or the five chord pulling back to the one. It is the one. And another example of the dominant chord being used as the one is this song. That E7 sharp nine chord has become so recognizable as the Jimi Hendrix Purple Haze chord. But you find that chord in other songs, including Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror. And there it's being used at a pivotal moment in the song to deliver the key change. So this really demonstrates the versatility of the dominant chord. It can be used in any position in your chord sequence, whether or not it's the tonal center, the home chord, or it's being used as a five chord to pull you back to the home chord, or it's being used as one of these secondary dominants pulling your attention to a new tonal center. The dominant chord is very effective and very comfortable playing all of those roles. But there's one more trick that dominant chords have up their sleeve and it relates back to the tritone buried within the structure. So if we look at a blues in the key of G, G7 is the one chord, C7 is the four chord, D7 is the five chord, coming back to the one. Now the tritone substitution rule states that you can play any dominant chord off its tritone using the tritone note as the new bass note of that chord. So to find the tritone, we start with the G and we go up three tones. That takes us to the C sharp. Now the C sharp is also here. And if I play the chord like this, the G7 like this, I'm voicing the one, the flat seven, and the major three. I can then drop this note here, which is the tritone sub. Keep these two the same, and I've got a perfect substitution for that G7. I've got a C sharp seven being a perfect tritone sub for the G7.
Now, the question is, why do we care about the tritone subs? And the answer is, it allows for some really interesting baseline movement. So if we're playing a blues in G, each of these three chords will have their own tritone subs available. G7 has the C sharp seven available. The four chord C7 has the F sharp seven available. And the D7 five chord has the G sharp seven available. And one of the things that makes blues sound so good is side slipping between some of the notes. And by that, I mean semitone movement above or below the chord we're approaching. This tritone sub approach allows us to incorporate that side slipping. I'll demonstrate. Now the tritone sub is not just limited to blues. It can be used wherever you've got a dominant chord. And a really nice way to use it is if you've got a 2-5-1, say in the key of C. So a 2-5-1 in the key of C would be D minor. D minor nine in this case. G7 or G13 and back to C major seven. So that move there. is a classic sounding move. But if we use the tritone sub on the G7 and instead play a C sharp seven, something interesting happens. We now get a chromatic bass movement from D down to C sharp, down to C. Really nice sound. So you can see that regardless of the style or genre we're writing in, the dominant chord really can be used in any position and to serve any function in your compositions. So I would encourage any songwriters out there who haven't really been using the dominant chord to take a closer look at it and focus on the relationships between the dominant chord you're using and the other chords around it. Look at the tension and release that you can create with those combinations of chords and see if it helps you break out of some old patterns and come up with some new and interesting chord progressions. Happy songwriting. Bye.